happens and the media is compelled to report it, as we think they should do, the families are in a unique position, we will tell you, to firstly restrict the public reaction, mitigate the public reaction to that tragedy in very important ways. And secondly, families have a right to not suffer the harms of when that public reaction is targeted against them. These are two things we believe very strongly, and that's, and that's what we're going to talk to you about today. Firstly, we're going to talk to you about the principle of this debate, where the state has an obligation to the victims and to the families' right to privacy. Secondly, we're going to talk to you about the harms that follow when families are unable to restrict, mitigate, and, and like redirect elsewhere the harms from this media coverage. A few things about the mechanism, what kind of cases we're talking about. Firstly, we're obviously excluding the perpetrator from these attacks. If the perpetrator themselves lies in it, we're fine with that. Put, like, we're fine like, informing like, society about them. That's outside of this debate. Um, secondly, we are happy to inform everyone what the tragedy consisted in, what happened. We're happy to have statistics. We're even happy to have general demographics. We just don't want information about individuals if members of the family, like direct members of the family, haven't been contacted to speak on their behalf. Not yet, not even done. Thirdly, um, what cases are we talking about? We're talking about all tragedies, right? Anything that happens in which a large number, like, number of people die. Um, most often we think this will apply to cases like school shootings, cinema shootings, church shootings, things like lone wolf terrorist attacks. But we're also happy, of course, covering that natural disasters, those kinds of things. But we think that in the most relevant cases are the ones in which there are political gains out of having information about individuals, which is why the media would have a particular interest in wanting to do that, or campaign groups would want to do that. Well, Those are all the, so the cases in which we think the family, in a second, um, is most likely to want to stop these, um, to, to want to stop these, uh, like, information from being heard. Verification. So to be clear, if you're the father of a school person who goes and shoots up a school, you don't get the right to deny that being a thing, I think, so that every other kind of person does. So, like, we could presumably discuss that in more detail, but we don't think it's relevant because that person has put themselves in that position to a different degree. Like, um, this is about the victims. We, like, comparatively, we just don't care as much about the perpetrator. Um, Right, great. This should be sufficiently clear. So also note, like, we, we think in the vast majority of cases, families will want to stop this. Um, that's what we envision happening quite often. We don't want, we don't believe these families are happy for their suffering to be hijacked for political gains. Um, but we say even when they accept it, we think that it's good. Um, because it gives families more say and more control over how the media then reports on these things. Know that families can place extensive conditions on how the reporting can happen. We say we will give you consent, but only if you talk about it in this and this way. We think that's important for reasons I'll get to in a minute. So firstly, let's talk about the principle, right? We say that the state owes an obligation to its citizens, in particular citizens that are vulnerable, either because people that like have literally just lost their lives, we think we still have obligations towards them, we have obligations towards families once we recognize that they're vulnerable. So the state should step in to regulate the media when it is harming those people. Firstly, what obligations does the state have to the victims? We say that everyone has a basic right to privacy, right? Everyone has a basic right to oh, identity. Exactly. That is why we don't allow and that is why we don't want the media to report on individuals without their consent on their everyday lives, right? We don't want straight like the media reporting on strangers going into like, I don't know, LGBT bars, for example. We don't want the media reporting on strangers like religious identity, their political identity. We consider that a huge intrusion on people's liberty. We hope opposition will agree. We think that these reasons don't go away once a person has passed away. We think that we still owe some sort of obligation to respect those things. If there are stuff that they would not have wanted to know, and it is easy for people to not make that known after their death, it is easy to respect that, and it is an important thing that we do. Things such as, were those people on drugs? Were those people gay and did not want to be outed? Did those people have religious and political leanings that would later go on to harm their perception, their reputation, but also their communities, right? And this is important, because very often, the reason people don't want things to be known about themselves is because it would hurt, it hurt others, not because it would hurt themselves. And we can't know that that is the case. We can't know if someone was hiding information from their family because they didn't want to hurt them. So the state has an obligation to uphold that right to privacy, even when they pass away to protect those people. Secondly, though, Honest. we say that the state also owes an obligation to the families, right? We recognize that after you have lost someone close to you, you are suffering, you are bereft, you're in a position that we recognize is incredibly vulnerable. That is why we allow families, after they've lost someone, to take time off work, for example. That's a very simple thing that just shows you need privacy, you need time to suffer for yourself to internalize what has happened. The last thing you need at that point is to not be allowed to move on because everyone around you is talking about the de like Question. graphic details of what happened to your children. Like, know that you can't even restrict to what extent the media reports on it which means that the media very often has huge incentives to be very graphic to sell huge amounts of like papers and so on. So we say that it is harmful. At the very, very least, you need to give the families input on how this information is conveyed because you owe an obligation to them not to suffer more at this point. So then, what else do we think are the harms that happen once you actually violate this important principle? We say three main things happen. Before I go into them, I'll take closing if they have me. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so even if individuals do have this right, but it's not families of, of the perpetrator, why is it that my parents, who presumably on your principle, wouldn't have a right to hate me usually do once I die? According to your what, principle. Well, like, we say families are just in a better position than the media to make this assessment. We say that families know you, they know what your interests are. Um, we think that is just 
a closer approximation at the very least. So let's talk about what the different harms that follow from this policy, right? We say, firstly, once you personify the, the, the victims of a crime, you're incredibly likely to follow this up with disproportionate public action, right? We say in every single circumstance, if there is, for example, a terrorist attack, it is almost always followed up with disproportionate action by the government of the people that have been attacked. See things like the Patriot Act, see, for example, like extensive and like a hugely disproportionate British response to a limited number of people that died in Tunisia. No, this wasn't even within their control because it wasn't even within their borders. And the response to that was incredibly disproportionate. The way that these things get enhanced is when you can put one particular face on it, right? That's when you get particular gains. When there's one single person you can empathize with, you can go like, in depth into the details of their lives. Those are the kinds of things that make people feel like, yes, that person is like me, therefore I do not want that to happen to me. Those are the kinds of things that prompt disproportionate action. Without this model, the media is absolutely uncontrolled and unrestricted from having information that can have huge political harms and lead to huge disproportionate action by personifying people in a way that only benefits them so that they can maximize their profits. We say families are likely to want to prevent this personification, to not be hijacked for profits, and therefore put a restriction on this, which means that the discussion after a like disaster has happened is a form of rational rule that needs to better outcomes and reducing radicalization in the long term, which these like like ex excessive harsh approaches do not have. But secondly, we say that families themselves have a right to prevent like direct attacks that happen to them. Firstly, in terms of re retaliation, right? Know that a lot of the crimes that we're talking about are crimes based on identity. See the church shootings in the US were based very much like were very much racially motivated against people for literally the color of the skin. We see that it is harmful then when people that obviously sympathize with these groups because there are more people than just the perpetrator that are willing to commit these crimes that do not want this media attention, that do not want to be demonized for the crime that has happened. We see that it is harmful when those people know exactly who to target if they resent the media attention that they are getting. They know exactly who sympathizes with the victims, they know exactly what families to attack. We say that families have a right to say, do not put my surname in the papers because I do not want to be attacked in retaliation. But thirdly, we see that when you have excessive information about the victims, this is exactly when victim blaming happens in an awful, awful way. See recently when Irish students were like died because a balcony had poor infrastructure and then it was released that they were drunk and this was crazy. This means that it was them themselves that were punished for something that happened to them, as opposed um, to the people that committed the crime. All of these things are awful. All of these things families are in a position to stop. Propose. In the instance of a tragedy, more often than not, the media has an incentive to be incredibly sympathetic to the family and people involved. Often when the family is not to blame, the family has done nothing wrong. We think it was unrealistic that open government tried to make this debate about whether or not families were harmed, given that to a large extent the media is going to be sympathetic and kind to them. We're going to explain to you why it is more probable in this debate that the instances we actually cut out are those where the parents' and children's interests do not necessarily align, and why that is principally unjust and something that practically has substantially worse outcomes. The first thing I want to do is be very clear about who's affected by this policy, because there was the implicit suggestion in open government that, you know, oh, it's just where the media, like, plays up lots of really bad things and tries to attack people. Two things need to coincide with this policy to have any effect. First of all, the media has to have an incentive to want to talk about the personal details of someone who has died in a tragedy. That is often some sort of social consideration. That is something like maybe a racialized aspect to your death, or a sexual identity that you had that was you know, instrumental in the way that that sort of violence came about. Second of all, your family needs to want no coverage. It is very plausible there are two reasons this sort of thing would happen. Either because they disagree with your lifestyle, right? They don't like to fight the fact that you were a gay person and beaten up or killed as a 
result of that. They don't like some aspect of your lifestyle that they never agreed with. Or additionally, because they themselves are some sort of complicit or responsible in the sort of violence that you may have perpetrated against other people. For instance, if you're a terrible parent, your child has sort of psychological problems, they go on to commit violence and atrocities. We think those are the two cases most likely to actually play out in this space because that is the only particular instance where the sorts of things that need this policy happen to coincide. So let's deal with some, first of all, an explicit piece of rebuttal. On the principal material, which is the first thing Sipstan and I want to talk about in this speech, I was not sure when I asked the point of clarification what was happening because it sounded to me like either if you were the father of a person who went and shot up a school who was killed as a result of that shooting by the police for her, you got, you know, you were not affected by this policy, right? Which would seem to me to concede the principle that sometimes practical consideration about what the public needed to know and maybe aspects of that crime were more important than the familial considerations. Or was the case they were merely saying that if you were the shooter yourself, you somehow survived, you know, we were going to cover you, like, you know, like that's just exogenous debate, whatever. But on the principle, we have two, three substantive responses. First of all, in the first instance, we trade off media rights against individuals at all times, right? For things like safety or public awareness. The fact that often one kind of crime or incident may be indicative of things that are likely to happen into the future. We think the media is often well placed to make those decisions, right? Because the sorts of things they choose to report when they have very high media standards, say CNN or a very you know, reputable publisher like the BBC, they tend to pick things that are likely to be repeatable and are in the public interest to broadcast. We trust them with that responsibility because they are very good at making that decision. On the other hand, having a blanket ban and prevents from discussing those very valuable cases. Second of all, the family often, their interests don't often align with these individuals, right? There was no principal claim why the parents had a right to decide what the ongoing legacy of that child was, other than they might be better placed to decide what that child wanted, right? Notice that that can easily flip the other way, right? Notice these are often hugely emotionalized or charged family situations that we're likely to be seeing, given that some sort of tragedy is in life. So they needed to do much better to decide why an absolute principal right for these families always existed. Thirdly, we simply don't think it is true. They agree that, you know, and suffer a huge harm as a result of this sort of thing, right? Because, you know, there are ways to insulate yourself against the media trying to beat up your family. Right? You often have media spokespeople. You get walls of support from the sort of organizations that are trying to run these stories in the first instance. You often get lots of money and time and support for people. So it's unclear where your life is practically made substantially worse. Lastly, on the sort of response to things, the way that we will deal with the example of Tunisia. The Tunisian example was silly, right? No family who was shot in you, know, a family member who was shot in Tunisia is going to ban their person being shot on the TV. They have no incentive to it. Right? They garner a large amount of subject sympathy, and they presumably want it to be known that was a real person who died in a horrible tragedy, right? But notice, secondly, if we remove any discussion of these things, people will simply default to their basic presumptions, right? If there is any discussion as to the actual reason of racialized violence or whatever, and maybe the fact that someone like Michael Brown or whatever was like killed unjustly, people will default to the already racist assumptions they have. So often the media is a good tool for breaking down those sorts of stereotypes. Last piece of substantive in this speech, the benefits to the kinds of coverage I discussed when I tried to delineate what kinds of cases we were talking about. First of all, on minorities, often these cases are exceptional for garnering moral support. First of all, because it humanizes. Seeing a statistic or a number like opening government said is one thing. Seeing the face of, say, a teen who was bullied because of their sexual identity and then was either killed or committed suicide as a result breaks that sort of moral distance between you and them. It is something that is likely to make you consider that thing. It is a useful tool for these organizations to garner lots more support and money and the sort of resources they need to actually affect positive change for those people. Secondly, because of reference to personal life, often like preventing these sorts of crises happening in the first instance is much more effective than trying to deal with them after they happen. For instance, preventing depression is far easier than trying to treat it once it has come about breaking the situation that allow depression to develop. What, do, what happens when you allow the media to choose how it reports on the public situations? Often something like the BBC or someone who's bullied and killed things will talk about what sort of circumstances confluenced in order to allow that person to feel so isolated and vulnerable they decide they necessarily have to kill themselves. At that point, as a person watching, you can talk about that with reference to your own life, right? See what sort of things you might be doing wrong. So this is very important causally for allowing people to prevent these sorts of things happening in the future. Last, secondly, on dangerous people. Um, I'll take a POI if anyone has one. Okay, so like the things that you've described might be things that family can send them to. But what about when there are message boards on these news sites that celebrate the death of those LGBT teenagers? I mean, like, people will be horrible on either side of the house, right? The difference is, on one side, we have organisations that are trying to use that as something constructive to prevent that harm occurring to other people in the future and are likely to get large amounts of support. On the other hand, like, dickheads can be dickheads on the internet or whatever anyway, come and abuse you in your day-to-day -day life. It's not clear why the harms aren't the same. Second of all, on dangerous people, it is hugely likely that in the cases of something like a school shooting, literally no family would ever allow this 
sort of information to be public. No, thank you. Why is that the case? Because there is an immense shame involved. If you are the parent of someone who committed, say, the Charlestown shooting or whatever, in a church, you have literally had a child who's walked into a bus and massacred innocent civilians. So these are cases that are extremely likely to be cut out of the public discussion. Why is that a shocking thing? First of all, because it cuts through, breaking down the sort of veil of ignorance about the worst causes of violence in places like America, which have hugely racialized society. Most people are hugely detached from the concept that people can be racist enough to just be outright violent towards other people. When the discussion is of a person who was so aggressively angry at the black population in their country, they took a gun into a school and shot them. Or when the family was so negligent or allowed circumstances to arise, that that child went and did that sort of thing. A, principally, that family's interest should not come out of the interest of the public. But B, it's an important rallying tool for getting people aware. Secondly, this is hugely a factor of garnering outrage. Often, the sorts of groups like Black Leader, NAACP in the US, needs to be able to like, speak to a large class of African Americans in order to get enough political capital and support behind them to do anything productive. That can only happen when you have tools of moral outrage, like these sorts of things are, where the violence is explicitly racist, there is an explicit delineation, and something that should be in the public eye. We've given you reasons why the only cases that are likely to be in play in this debate fall decisively on the opposition side. The government teams need to do a lot better at explaining why they're actually shutting out anything productive. We've got the leader of the opposition and are delighted to call upon the Prime Minister. Dear panel, it's not enough for opposition to just go up and talk about all the cases where this mo model will probably not apply. Like, if that is the only thing they need, like, we are absolutely happy to agree with that. There are probably lots of cases where the family is just fine. However, in those situations, which I will explain more, we still get the win that the media has to approach them. They still get some kind of say in how this thing is going to be depicted. So in as much as they want to have a kind of more running point and so on, for those cases we still win. But note that this debate still takes place in very many contexts, as Olivia brought you, where there are lots of people who would not want to have this depicted, or at least would want to limit the way it's going to be depicted in very many ways. But to bring you some more analysis on exactly what happens when, when this kind of material is used in campaigns, which is also, uh, and also how this creates more tension, especially like racial tension, but all, and also why this is very likely, in their best case scenario, to lead to bad policy that leads to a lot of bad outcomes. For the kind of direct point of rebuttal. So I think we're very happy to agree with the previous speaker when he says that the perpetrator is just extraneous to this debate, which he conceded we think is fine. It's unclear why then went on to make his last point. We think there's like, in terms of the principle that underlies that, like, first of all, we probably think that we can, that one can imagine some greater benefit in telling more details about someone who actually had causal reasons related to this particular crime, whereas it's very unclear why in the most cases the victims who just did the dying would have any kind of causal relation to that. There's no information to be gained that the fact that someone had to be in the wrong place in the wrong time as beneficial for understanding and preventing these kind of crimes. Like if it's about racial crime, it's enough, as Olivia said, to just say there was a vast majority of people of a minority in that place. It's not necessary to talk about their individual characteristics. So there's it is extraneous, but there's also no principal concession by that. The second no, thank you. Um, then he says, oh, you know, people are probably going to be dicks on either side. We're trying to challenge the idea that maybe it's bad when, pe when you get people's names um, at, uh, and, there, uh, and there might be groups who want to harm these people. Like, note that it is probably bad that people can be unpleasant on either side of the house on the internet. Well, Olivia brought this specifically. It's probably a lot worse when the people who are going to be unpleasant to you can now go to your house and do real nasty things to you because now your identity is out there. So the very small step which a lot of people to incite this kind of violence and then actually go and do something about it. That means that the actual impact of this particular hatred becomes worse on, uh, on their side of the house. Uh, the rest of the rebuttal, as far as I, can, I am concerned, is interwoven. So, First of all, let's make, it, let's make it very clear before we go to the less layers. In cases where, there's, where it's beneficial, people will consent to this. When it's not beneficial for them, we do think that the analysis we have for opening and uh, opening opposition does not apply and it's really important to have this model. The first reason for that is in terms of campaigns, right? So, 
What generally happens in terms of campaigns? Now, when it comes to political campaigns, especially in the US, where most of the examples have come from so far, it's very common for politicians who have a particular agenda to look for these kind of catastrophes and find particular stories that they can link to their campaign. And then the thought is cool, they don't need to ask permission for this. They can just dig out the information about these people and say, little Jimmy would have wanted this, or this person would have wanted this, right? Without having any consideration whatsoever what little Jimmy or Timmy actually care about in their lives. Why is this harmful? First of all, we just think that this is morally illegitimate. You don't get to take someone who has done nothing wrong other than happen to be the victim of a very tragic event and then use them and instrumentalize them as a tool. Even if we get a little bit more and more support, it is never clear why it's okay for us to instrumentalize individuals to use them for political gains. But secondly, we just think that for very many cases, it's likely that the family is going to share the views even if there might be some exceptions, most often political views run in families. What that means now is that when this, when the son of a family, in the context of all this loss of bereavement, now is displayed as like a figurehead to the Republicans or a figurehead to the Democrats, the family, if they live in a community where there's a strong consensus on the other side, will have been really exposed because now their neighbors and other people in the community are going to wonder why are you supporting this side? Now, in most cases, that might be a bad thing. But note that if this is in a violent community where a lot of these accidents happen, then the fact that you're being depicted as being part of a political side that you're not part of might actually make you exposed to real violence or real harassment. That's why it's so important that you have a right to have a say and say, no, we don't consent to this, we don't allow for this. If, once again, if the family finds that this is okay and they want to do it, they all have the opportunity to consent. That means the media can always approach them, and, or the campaigners can always approach them, but they have no obligation to suffer the extra stigma or possibly harassment as a consequence of having this displayed uh, without their, uh, their consent. Yes? I think the point is that unless you think the family of a person who commissioned an act are guilty of that act, then you are principally entirely hypocritical in allowing them to be thrown to the masses, but not any other family. All families are innocent. Look. And all the rest on this point, I've shown you why there's a difference in the instrumentality of how this information can be used, there's a difference to what extent this is beneficial and like public knowledge, and like, fine, if you want to make this a debate about that, you, you will have to do that by conceding practically all of our principles. So, that's about how it's going to be used in campaigns, why that's really harmful. Secondly though, in terms of why this creates more tension. Let me give a report to a lot of analysis, right? Like, first, I've got three main uh, ideas here. The first one is, is prob you probably have a say if you want to be the cause of more tension in your community. How does this work? It's very likely that if you live in a community where there's already some tension and you're part of the kind of moral campaign they talk about where a lot of people get up in arms and demonstrate in the streets probably against something, you probably feel that like you have a guilt in creating that kind of thing. If that leads to violence or that leads to any other kind of harm, you probably feel that like you've been used in a way that you didn't want to consent to be used as a member of that family. Then that's very, very harmful. But secondly, the same kind of backlash and harms come in this situation is if your son has been the, the cause of this kind of this increase in tension in the society, it's much more likely that you're going to have um, you're going to face these kind of repercussions. And thirdly, we think that in terms of victim blaming, it's just going to become much worse as well. You know, everyone who wants to work against this kind of new campaign or this political movement they talk about, are going to try to dig out dirt and bad things about you to make that campaign seem less plausible. I mean, we're get, going to get lots of secondary and tertiary intrusions into these families who are already suffering so much that they should be enjoying protection, not further exploitation. Finally, even if we get some more campaigns, we think they're going to lead to the worst kind of policies. The best kind of policies happen when we can consider all stakeholders and we can make balanced decisions based on the probability of things happening. When these kind of things happen, they're very likely to be exceptions, that's what we call them catastrophes. That means we're more likely to create bad policy or policy that doesn't consider long-term things or disrespect related to public um, aggression. But even if it is a good policy, when it's done in this context, it's more likely to become overturned or provoke lots of people about doing Nasty things. Because of that, incredibly happy to propose.
position. It is not okay for the Deputy Prime Minister to get up here and say, look, obviously guys, when it's good and in the public interest, the families will allow it, and when it's not, they won't allow it. Obviously, for this debate to function, you clearly have to look on the margins. So that's what John did, that's what I'm going to continue to do in this speech. We're going to identify specifically the kind of cases that we think would be present in the media under the status quo, that are cut out under their model, and why we think there are significant harms to that. So, what am I going to do in this speech? First, I want to look at explicitly the harm that they brought in terms of harassment and violence to the family, why we think you know that's probably not important in this debate. Secondly, I want to give very specific analysis on why we think the individual characteristics are so important to getting these stories across, why that's important. Thirdly, I want to deal with this kind of like, are we talking about the perpetrator? Are we talking about the perpetrator stuff? And fourthly, I want to look at specifically why we think the state or like other organizations are to a degree, like legitimate and instrumentalizing people once they have died, given that they do so all the time when they're alive, and given that we say the ends broadly are good and therefore justify the means. So, firstly, on harassment and violence. So we just say that, like in general, it's just deeply unlikely that someone's going to harass or be violent towards the family of someone whose son has just died in a school shooting. Yes. We just find that that is not something that has happened, so we don't think it's important in this debate. Secondly, we say if it is likely that it is going to occur, we have all kinds of protection mechanisms already. We can give these people police protection, we can give them new identities, etc. So in the most extreme cases that I try and talk about, we say we have methods to uh, protect that. Next, we just say that, like, really, prima facie, it is more likely. So when we say who's going to exclude their, their, their son or their daughters from detail being published in the news, is it going to be, you know, the Democrat supporting family whose son was killed, you know, in some kind of school shooting, or is it going to be the parents who are ashamed of the fact that their child was gay living in, you know, Texas, and, you know, the fact that their home environment probably contributed to the fact that their son or daughter committed suicide. We just think that it is likely that the parents' interests don't always coincide with the interests of the child, and we think in those cases it is most important that we get the story across. So, next, why are individual characteristics, no thank you, most important? It's firstly, note an important concession in the PM speech when they say, oh, we'll probably allow them to say things like uh, the victim was black, which is probably a concession to the point that we say that individual characteristics make a story yeah. important, right? The fact that a police officer shot someone is less like meaningful in terms of a propaganda tool for correcting the fact that we have systemic injustices and biases against African Americans in America than saying, you know, that this victim was black. Moreover, we say that actually their kind of middle ground is a perverse harm, because what you hear when you just say, oh, a black person was shot by the police, is instantly it plays into the kind of racial biases and undertones that they seek to correct, because people will just assume, oh, they were probably committing some kind of crime, oh, they were probably suspicious, and all the kind of preconceived notions that they identify exist are reinforced and made better once you don't have any kind of counter narrative. But when we say, look, this was an unarmed teenager, they were going to the shops, they you know had a promising young future, then we humanize the victim and make people see the, the problems for what we have. And we just say that the more characterization is just most impactful. Instead of just saying, you know, someone died from carbon monoxide poison or a teen killed themselves, we say, look, this teen hung themselves because they were consistently bullied at school for the fact that they were gay. This is what they day-to-day -day life was like. They felt ostracized by their own church, by their own family because of the state that they lived in and how they were treated. That humanizes it because you identify on a very personal level rather than just a statistic. Suddenly it's not just, you know, 10 people died this year, it's that person who looks like me, who I might interact with. It could be a child like mine and it forces people to confront on a very personal level. No, thank you. The kind of harms that accrue. Next, on the perpetration stuff. So first let me just say they concede lots of the principles of their case when we say, oh, we probably won't include the perpetrators and stuff. Unclear why the family of the perpetrator, who might have had nothing to do with the fact that their child turned out to be a school tutor, shouldn't have their privacy protected, shouldn't be protected from violence, and they were probably also the group that is most likely to receive the kind of reparative violence. So weird concession of that principle there. So let's assume that this debate includes them as well. Because if it doesn't, we probably won at this point. But you know, let's give closing go up the benefit of the doubt and say it probably does. Firstly, challenges stereotypes. So when we hear, you know, a Palestinian has been burnt alive two days ago in Israel, people probably just assume, oh, you know, probably those classic Palestinians being mean to each other. Actually, having a real story that says this was a Jewish extremist from Israel humanizes and allows people to not, you know, conform to these stereotypes. 
When we hear, you know, a school was shot and we don't know anything about the person, you know, the, the, like the conservative gun lobby in America will just say, oh, probably those Muslim terrorists. Again, actually being forced to confront the fact that overwhelmingly the people who oh, carry out school shooting are, you know, like pro Confederate flag waving white young Republican boys means that these stereotypes have something to be challenged with. When they're never challenged, they're just reinforced. A conspicuous silence over, you know, the race or other characterizations of these perpetrators allows these people to be like further. And firstly, we just say it's probably important just to understand the causes of why these events happen. What is it that drove an individual to shoot up a school? It's not always the case that they're just abjectly crazy. There are often specific circumstances that contribute to that. They might have problems with mental health that were inadequately dealt with by the state. They might have been unemployed. And these are things that we fit. Go, Olivia. The only group your policy helps is the minority of parents that are embarrassed about specific things about the victims that they don't want to come out. Why can't they tell the media, report on everything, except these facts, like we told you? Okay, because firstly, those facts are often the things that are most important in terms of humanizing the case, otherwise the family would be fine with reporting it. So in the case of, you know, a gay teenager hanging out, they just say, oh, just say that everyone was mean to her, but don't mention the fact that she was actually a lesbian. We say that is often the thing the family's most embarrassed about, is often the thing that was like, contributed most to those factors. So let's just take this on the higher one. Let's just say that, you know, it's just unclear to us at all. They've given us no real justification other than that families get sad by this. Why we should prioritize as a state the family's own ability to kind of experience some kind of lesser grief than it is to instrumentalize these people to causes that we say are fundamentally good. Why? So firstly, we just instrumentalize people all the time. When we force them to pay taxes, when we force them to abide by certain laws, we mitigate their individual freedoms at the cost of a wider benefit to society. Right? Next, we say that often in cases, it's just unclear why this is like such a massive harm to the families. Every time they read their kind of watered down news story, the family will obviously know it's referring to their son. They will still get those harms. Nothing is going to bring their son or daughter back anyway. Families often just prioritize their own self-interest necessarily over what it could be good for society. So why is it really important? Because often, firstly, the media has a narrative to sell which is relevant to the social climate. <coughs> so what we mean is that stories about an LGBT committing suicide are often the most powerful that the media wants to sell. Stories about racial violence are really important to sell, which is why the media focus on these. And it makes these campaign groups and campaigns to fix these problems that much more effective when we have a human story, when we lose material propaganda under their side of the house, when people prioritize the fact that they are sad over the fact that we might be able to get real and substantive change to reduce bullying, to reduce opposition, to reduce police racism in the state. We just think we get so many benefits on this side of the house and they didn't engage with the comparative. That's why we were. Guys up in the he just asked it. Okay, he's he's like, don't touch it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the guy, the guy literally said, let's go back up to I I can put a we can put a thing over. We can put a piece of paper. No, no, I assume that they're probably different So if it's red, then click it and it's not red, it's not red. Awesome. Thank you.
So we take a member of the opposition and are delighted to welcome the member of government. So we've heard from opposition a disgusting characterization of what the media are actually like. It's like you live in families where, the, where like your, your family member, a victim, the identity has been stripped down, made into one element of the identity and been criticised constantly by you. I'm going to tell you two things today. First, we're going to talk about the incentives of the media, the power of that media, and why that's a bad thing in these cases. Secondly, I'm going to talk about why specifically, this is what Jenny brings you, why families are better placed than the media to be making decisions as to whether there is like benefit of these sorts of stories getting into the media on a case-by-case -case basis. A few responses um, to, to the extension, right? First of all, like we see that they just don't respond to Jenny's stuff about like, who, who is, like, why the media are so phenomenally bad in making these sorts of decisions. Second of all, we get two things out of them. Firstly, they say like, under the status quo, you're more likely to be able to avoid this backlash because you can just not read the newspapers. We say that under the modern, like, modern, like, culture, it is impossible to ignore the things that are online, the things that are being posted in your local newspapers that are put in stands in your local supermarket. Ignore the fact that your friends and your family and everyone else in your community will have read those things and will be asking you questions about them, right? So we just don't buy this characterization that it's okay. easy to get away from that harassment. Like, they've just denied the fact that harassment happens in the first place. We see it does, and it's phenomenally detrimental. Right, right. Second of all, we hear, like, this idea about pressure, right, and how communities will pressurise individuals into consenting and so it's not fair. Firstly, well, we have like massively more option on our side of the house as to whether you want to consent to this thing. Anyway, secondly, we say that communities are probably best placed to be most understanding about their, like, their friend's position in this and most understanding when they want to take the position that they would rather not have their, their loved one's identity published in the media. And thirdly, like we just say that you in, as an individual are best placed to decide whether you want to be used as a political tool and whether you being used as a political tool is a good thing in the, in like in in the grand scheme of things given the rest of my stuff and why media is so bad so one power of the media incentives of the media we say that the certain headlines sell right certain headlines that play on certain elements of stories make stories larger than they already are and make them more interesting because people like to read things that are more complicated and more like more sensationalized because there's just more to read and more interesting things to read, right? We say that, like, when we get into opening opposition characterization that the media is best placed to make these decisions, we say that absolute rubbish, right? Bottom line is that the newspapers can't do any social good if they don't exist, right? So sales is literally the most important thing to those newspapers. Also see countless examples of where newspapers and media corporations do horrible things to people in order to get a good story, right? So we say that that characterization means that, like, we just not, like, happy to accept the idea that they care about social good more than they care about profits, right? Opposition say themselves that this debate is about margins. We agree, right? We say that when there are like clear benefits to the identities being released, we say that like likely the families will consent. We say that it's unlikely when you have massive harms. We say it's actually way, way more horrible than opposition have made out of when your family is constantly being harassed, not so the, like Why not only by people around who have read these stories, right? But by the media themselves, who now have incentive to keep digging and keep digging because that story is sold and they want to sell even more. See the stuff that Jenny talks about with like click like click baiting, right? So it's it, like it's Wait. important to the media to get as much information as possible. When that is continuing, you get massive harms to the families. No thank you. So we say that like public find sensationalized stories in like interesting because a small a small bit of information can produce a massive knee-jerk reaction. We hear loads from opposition about the LGBT kids who killed themselves, right? Notice that the fact that you introduced the information that that child was an LGBT child, LGBT child, that story becomes a story about the LGBT individual killing themselves because note the fact that we don't often like know why people have chosen to, to 
to commit suicide, right? So that, that motivation comes from the newspapers wanting to make it a larger story than it already is, when that makes the family incredibly uncomfortable, either because they like see it as inaccurate or they're embarrassed, right? We say that like this, that has massive harms. But like also we see it in things like instance of sexual violence, right? When it becomes incredibly important to people for some reason to find out what sort of clothes the woman wears, right? So we see that these these sorts of things make small stories bigger stories. That's why Point like we see no thank you. So we say why is this bad, right? Because in the worst case scenario, we get things like horrible prejudices being perpetrated like over and over again in 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 the media, right? right? And, and therefore in wider society. Also, you get just horrible and inaccurate stories, right? So you get an, an individual that is stripped down to like one part of their identity, something that is incredibly uncomfortable for a family who know that their loved one was much more than that one part of that identity. You also get just crowding out of other like really important issues, right? Especially like when there are certain biases towards like certain that? elements of a story, you get things like that are largely ignored. Now, note the fact that you don't often get massive like in detail information into like black victims, for example, especially like overseas and okay. um, those sorts of things closing. Okay, on our side of the house we have competition between good newspapers and bad newspapers. When you have none of that and you only have the internet which we've shown is terrible, why is that a good thing? So, like, <coughs> we don't understand, like, you don't have good newspapers and bad newspapers, right? So we say that, like, it's probably a good thing that all newspapers are good and doing good things and we want them to always be doing good things. Like, and we say that on the internet, like, it's, it's probably always bad, but it's much, much worse under your case, sorry if I've misunderstood what that. So why are families best placed? And we say this is just crucial, right? Because we say, even if they are, like, 100% infallible, they're probably good most of the time, or at least far better than the media are, right? See the fact that even if a family is still a little bit embarrassed that their child was gay and that like they, they didn't they felt uncomfortable with that they probably still care about that child still care about their story and still care about the, the fact they don't want it to happen to other people right so there are when there are clear advantages we said that you are likely to get those clear advantages at the point at which a family can recognize those right we say that when like they're, they're, when there are clear harms to the family themselves, first of all, they are better to know what those clear harms are, how detrimental they will be to that family, and they have to the like social benefits that the newspaper tells them what to get, but also like they're more likely to know most about that case individually. They're more likely to know the sort of information that's coming out. They're more likely to understand the effect it will have on their local community. That's why it's imperative that we leave this decision with the families that this affects most. For these reasons, very proud to propose. <laughs> Paul and I want you to know two simple facts at the end of this debate. They have not succeeded in protecting the families that they told you was their burden to protect. And secondly, it is unfair of them in a society to deny this information and to prioritise not all families, but the families of people who first prop like. First point then, why this hurts families more? Recognise that Paul told you this is a pressure, a pressure that you cannot win from, because either you decide to do nothing, however in their comparative, if you hold information back, then there is nothing out there. It is not that you, like, on both sides families have to decide whether they want to get involved in a campaign. On their side, if I don't get involved in that campaign and give my explicit consent, then I stop that campaign. I take away vital information that cannot come out in any other way. That is an incredible pressure that they put upon families. But second of all, recognise equally that this pressure comes from an incredible norm that like often that this has to be a positive decision to out my child to tell the world about this i have to actively sacrifice that information in a way that i didn't have to earlier that like in allowing a passive role no thank you you don't have to go through that specific decision making process in your own head as to how you view your child comparative to a campaign and how you want to weigh that up. that is a pressure that they get no response to however what we are told is that that's far far worse on our side because of bad newspapers like, look, 
Paul gave analysis as to how, how the internet is so incredibly harmful. The reason it's very harmful, like they say it's less bad because the information won't be out there, presumably, is their argument, and so there's nothing the internet can speculate on. The problem is that what's most hurtful is often speculation, not specific facts, not them saying something about the child, but them wondering, was it because she was asking for it? Was it because he was gay? Was it because these things which are incredibly offensive and will be all over the internet? Like, thank you. Recognize that the extension from proposition was that we cannot regulate all media, specifically Paul explained that this is an issue, like in places like the, uh, like, but that we can actually regulate printed media. We do have ethics. We do stop them printing horrible things, lies and slanders. We do demand apologies, like what happened after that awful piece in the New York Times about Berkeley. But that doesn't happen online. Like on both sides, yes, we can't regulate it. But on our side, we at least give the support to families in terms of that pressure is out there that you don't have to make that decision. Equally note that it was like true. You will see newspapers. It is to an extent in your public sphere to respond to the last speaker. It is less in your public sphere than when he, like newspapers are specifically constantly no thank you coming to you. Yes, not harassing you, but constantly asking you that question. Second, family members and people around you are constantly putting that pressure on you. Why is it that you won't stop this oppression for other black children? Why is it that you won't make a campaign? Why don't you care about what happened to your child? Is something that no family should have to face. That that's why we say it is more in your sphere. Yes, it's difficult to ignore newspapers and the media. Like it's just non-comparative for them to say that. It is worse when there is an incentive for them to constantly bring it to your face. Second, no thank you, no response to the fact that if I want to correct something, I have to out myself. I have to say, I am his father, I know these facts specifically, and this is why you are wrong. That is a massive burden and a pressure to over, and that is a pressure that forces me into staying silent. There is all of this respect and compassion for me when uh, when t details are going in a general sense. Like when something offensive is said and a parent comes in and says, no, 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 that was too far, we all immediately feel a deference to that. Like, some awful people won't, but there's a massive amount of support for the family and networks there that is just just lacking on this proposition, no thank you. When they don't give that support to them, they don't get a response. Like, notice Paul told you that this is unlikely to be something that in your calculus would make you tell all the details at first. However, it is long run something that makes your process far more difficult, especially since first prop's burden that they set themselves is that they will let you move on and let you forget about that. Like, forget it under your proposition. It actively makes all of those things so much worse. But this wasn't just a debate about practicalities, it was equally a debate about how we, no thank you, are specifically able, why we think that the media is better placed in terms of getting this information out than we need it, that engaged with both sides on their uh, principal uh, levels. So first off, second half tell us, with the media, you see, they're all about their profits. Like, recognize that this, to an extent, is a self-interest, but it is a feedback mechanism to society in terms of valuable information that they genuinely need. Like, sometimes, yes, it does lead them to do awful things and horrendous ideas. That's why we have regulation, Paul told you. That's why we, are, like, not just that we have things like we can sue for slander and we can give you that power, but equally there are ethics there. There are, like, there are complaint mechanisms. There are, like, there's a reason that they don't want to publish things. No, thank you. Teeth that up. The reason why we think parents are worse place is first because they are entirely self-interested, but second because they have this guilt. Like Paul told you, this is the most traumatic period of your life. You want to try to move on, move on. That should be your uh, your priority. You are not placed to decide national agendas for what the world should be discussing. But Paul said that there are other victims who need to hear about this. Like, for every gay teenager that is attacked, there are thousands of others. This is the one visceral image of an atrocity that often goes on every single day for thousands of people. We think that they are equally connected to that victim and equally deserve a response. First half tell you that that response is likely to be disproportionate. Paul was the one who beat this in his extension when he told you that there will always be a disproportionate attack. Like, people are outraged at the concept of, like, 9-11 will never just be a little thing, even if we never heard names. The difference is that Paul tells you that a name sticks in our memory, so we continue that conversation long enough for society to rationalise out an actual campaign. That is a long and a drawn out process, he told you. No, thank you. Uh, but it does bring you to, or actually I'll take over you in a second, but it does bring you to an actual relevant end point, because we can continue our conversation to the point where we can have a reason. <laughs> when people are forgotten, when we move on and don't remember one boy's name, or don't remember the face of one victim who was harmed, we don't have that discussion going forward on our side. We need that on society's better. So we, and we think that the victims who be harmed are just as important. Opening. It seems obvious to me that victim blaming and the suffering of families happens far more when people are talking about
about it without any of your restrictions and any of your consent. It's not clear to me how social media can stipulate things when they have literally no information about who the victims were. Okay, the point is that they knew an atrocity happened. That's why, like, since we are all predisposed to blame victims, it is likely that if you don't have any information about that victim, you are more likely to you will have that discussion. But I will specifically, with the last point I want to talk about, talk about victim blame. Look, as an Irish person, it was hor horrifying and really offensive to hear what happened out of Berkeley and to hear the atrocity, uh, the, like the atrocious accusations made. Recognise first that there are ethics and there is defence of that. For every horrific victim blaming statement that comes out, there is an ability to have a response only when we have that through an appropriate channel like a newspaper. But more importantly, recognise that real information is actually needed from that. Like, yes, it was awful that there was put out that they were drinking and that was tried to tie to say that they were in some way not innocent, but the fact that I may go on a day one to America, the fact that I knew this was student accommodation, that they were Irish, that they that, that could be me, first off, is specific information to me that I need in terms of putting myself in that position, but second, necessarily led to the support that caused the retraction of that statement. Having an Irish embassy behind you, having the statements and details about that, like, there are two sides to every story. Some bad information will come out from this proposition. We're not saying we're perfect in opposition. We say we can bring you to a world where we are better at, at, at dealing with these issues on a society-wide level, and we can help the victims more. We are so proud of you.